Good evening. I'm Mehdi Hassan. As rioters clashed with police officers one year ago to storm the United States Capitol, as they used barricades to break windows and breach the interior, as members of the House and media crouched in the gallery, clearly terrorized, while on the other side of the Capitol in the Senate, you had insurrectionists wearing tactical gear and holding zip ties. And let's not forget the angry crowd chanting to hang then Vice President Pence. As all of that was unfolding on that bloody, violent and deadly day, other members of Congress were hiding out in their offices throughout the Capitol. Among them, a young Republican from Wisconsin named Mike Gallagher. The Iraq War veteran had barricaded the door to his office and unshielded his Marine Corps ceremonial sword. He'd armed himself to defend his position should he need to fight. And as he waited, he even went online to appeal to the then president, his Republican president, to call off the mob. Right now, I am sheltered in place in my office because we have protesters who have stormed the Capitol, clashing with Capitol police, forcing their way into Statuary Hall. The vice president of the United States was just rushed off the floor of the House by Secret Service. This is Banana Republic crap, Mr. President. You have got to stop this. You are the only person who can call this off. Call it off. The election is over. Call it off. This is bigger than you. It's bigger than any member of Congress. It is about the United States of America, which is more important than any politician. Call it off. It's over. It's over. Powerful words from Congressman Gallagher. It is over. But if there is one single thing to take away on this first anniversary of the assault on the U.S. halls of government, it is that the effort to upend American democracy is not over. The insurrection is ongoing. It keeps rolling on. Only one week later, one week after January the 6th, Congressman Gallagher voted against impeaching Donald Trump. And in May of last year, he voted against forming a commission to investigate the insurrection he so eloquently tried to stop. So appeals to the former president and self-aggrandizing op-eds be damned. Watch what Republican lawmakers like Mike Gallagher do and not what they say, because I don't want to give the impression that he is doing this alone as they slowly, methodically drip, drip, drip their way into a permanent hold on what used to be a democratic form of government here in the US. As one of the foremost experts on civil war told us on this program last night, this, what this nation is experiencing right now, this is what it looks like when democracies fail and get overturned in the 21st century with extreme partisan division and sporadic violence, all of it spurred on by social media. And the partisan divide keeps growing wider. Between March and September of last year, Americans became less likely to say it was important to find and prosecute the January 6th insurrectionists, with all of the decline coming from Republicans. It was against this backdrop today that President Joe Biden, even as he acknowledged that this is about much, much more than certifying his own election against Donald Trump, called out the former president for continuing to propagate the dangerous big lie. Here's the truth. The former president of the United States of America has created and spread a web of lies about the 2020 election. He's done so because he values power over principle, because he sees his own interest as more important than his country's interest, than America's interest. And because his bruised ego matters more to him than our democracy or our Constitution, he can't accept he lost. So at this moment, we must decide what kind of nation are we going to be? Are we going to be a nation that accepts political violence as a norm? Are we going to be a nation where we allow partisan election officials to overturn the legally expressed will of the people? Are we going to be a nation that lives not by the light of the truth, but in the shadow of lies? We cannot allow ourselves to be that kind of nation. 
The way forward is to recognize the truth and to live by it. Strong words, necessary words from the President of the United States today. But in order to understand what's at stake going forwards, we do need to be clear-eyed about what happened that day, one year ago. That crowd attacking Congress was baying for the blood of lawmakers. California Democrat and impeachment manager Congressman Eric Swalwell told some of his story during last year's impeachment trial. As I heard that announcement on the floor, I saw the new House chaplain on just her fourth day on the job, walked to the front podium. Unannounced and amidst the chaos, she started to recite a prayer for peace. Uncertain what would happen next, I sent a text message to my wife. I love you and the babies. Please hug them for me. Earlier today, I spoke with Congressman Swalwell alongside his wife, Brittany. Congressman Swalwell, Brittany Swalwell, thank you so much for joining us on this special show this evening. Uh, Congressman, let me start with you. We just heard you speaking about your text to Brittany about your kids on that day at the impeachment trial. What other things do you remember about that day? What was it like having to text her in that way? Mehdi, I started the morning on a run uh, to the Capitol, and I remember running and, and seeing a number of Proud Boys wearing body armor. and thinking uh, as I ran by them to kind of just protect my own face because uh, they were in a, a big pack and still not thinking that they would actually violently attack the Capitol. And, and then, Mehdi, um, I gaveled in the session that day at noon. I appointed the tellers uh, and asked the chaplain to offer a prayer. And just hours later, that same chaplain, as the mob descended on the chamber, abruptly went back to the podium where she gave the prayer just hours ago and started praying for us as we were in a duck and cover position and I'm holding the gas mask. And to me, it felt a little bit like a last rites. And, and that was when I sent the text message uh, to my wife. I, I just, at that point, didn't know if we were going to leave yeah. uh, and be able to get out of it. Awful. Brittany, how did that day unfold for you? What went through your mind when you got those texts and saw the images of what was happening at your husband's place of work? Of course, we, we are certainly no stranger to violence and threats. Um, you know, the former president calls my husband's name um, out on the news all the time. So we are constantly receiving those kinds of death threats. We never, I never in my wildest dreams thought that um, American citizens, people, you know, us could um, get into the Capitol and, and, and be so violent uh, inside the Capitol towards um, my husband and his colleagues. It was it was surreal initially. And then um, my first instinct was just to get in my car, get my kids from school. They um, are on school near the hill. I just wanted them home safely with me. And that, that was my first instinct. But of course, it was just... Um, shocking and and unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, even looking at the images now, it's still unbelievable. Congressman, how do you feel now, one year later? Do you feel safer in your workplace? How do you feel about uh, the threat to the Capitol as of today, a year on from the insurrection? The building is much more secure. I, I don't know if that's a great thing because it's not as accessible, and, and I, I hate that. And it's almost as if the Republicans have weaponized that, too. They were a part of the arson team that brought the mob there, and, and now they yeah. criticize the fact that you have to, you know, have a fire department to put it out, right? They, they say that it's a, a security yes. complex, and they get that against us. Um, but I, I don't think the temperature in the country has come down. And, you know, we received just over the weekend a number of death threats that we had to forward along to the Capitol Police. The police chief of the Capitol said yesterday in testimony that there were 9,500 threats last year to lawmakers. And, and, and unless Kevin McCarthy and the leaders of the Republican Party start to condemn violent rhetoric, you're going to see a Republican Party and its voters who will continue to choose violence over voting. Yes. And Brittany, your three kids, 
are still quite young, but you and your husband have included them uh, in this story of American democracy for nearly uh, their whole lives. Um, we have uh, some images there on screen. He brought your uh, then two-month-old daughter to the 2019 swearing-in of the new Congress so she could be present as a record number of women took office and Nancy Pelosi took the speaker's gavel. What do you want your kids to know about January the 6th, 2021? What lessons do you hope they draw as they grow up about what's happening right now in this country? And the initial lesson just, you know, personally is that how brave uh, their father on that day, um, first and foremost, and to know that he is a public servant who um, sacrifices a lot um, for the sake of the democracy. And I think they will see that in looking back at history books and, and the different um, ways that the um, it's, it's shown. So they'll, they'll learn that their father was very, very um, brave that day. Thank you to Brittany Swalwell there. And still to come, I'll continue my con conversation with Congressman Swalwell about whether his party can save American democracy. Plus, later in this show, we'll debunk four of the biggest Republican lies about the day on which angry Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol. Don't go away. As we reflect on today's somber anniversary, I spoke to Congressman Eric Swalwell about where we go from here. Here is the rest of our conversation. Congressman, President Biden gave a powerful speech today on the anniversary of the insurrection. Have a listen to a bit of what he said. I did not seek this fight brought to this Capitol one year ago today, <clears throat> but I will not shrink from it either. I will stand in this breach I will defend this nation, and I will allow no one to place a dagger at the throat of democracy. I think we can agree, Congressman, that was a very strong speech today, fighting words even from the president. But where has that fight been for the past year? And is this going to be a new and improved Joe Biden for 2022, taking the, fright, taking the fight to Trump and the GOP? Or is this just him getting emotional on the anniversary? We need more of that, don't we, what we just saw? Yeah, that's how we want him to lead. And for the first year, I, I think he you know, cautiously tried to bring the country together, didn't want to talk too much about the former president. But look, uh, the Republicans aren't interested in doing that. They're ramping up their violent rhetoric. It reminded me of one of my favorite movies uh, growing up, uh, Bad Boys, with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. And Martin Lawrence, his partner, uh, was a very cautious driver. Uh, and finally, at the last scene of the movie, as Martin Lawrence is the driver, uh, he escapes uh, after driving pretty fast and pretty uh, wildly. And Will Smith looks at him and says, that's how I want you to drive. From now on, that's how you drive. And that's how I felt about that speech. Like, that's how I want you to lead as our president. Like, lead like that. We've had many analogies uh, for Joe Biden on this show. I think that's the first one uh, with Martin Lawrence. Uh, Congressman, you're the fifth congressional Democrat I've interviewed uh, in this new year, in 2022, and I want to ask you what I've asked the rest of them. Is this the year Democrats as a whole, not just Democrats in the House, but the party with the president passes voting rights legislation? Is it not shameful that your party got nothing signed into law on voting rights in 2021, the year of the insurrection, the year your party controlled both Congress and the White House? It is shameful, uh, but we have a second act in this second session uh, of the Congress. And so this is it really for democracy. Uh, the Republicans have shown us who they are. They choose violence over voting. And if they win in the midterms, Mehdi, I promise you, they will never again allow a peaceful transition of power. Not the people who are in charge right now, not the base of the party as Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates describe themselves yeah. as, a, as the base. They're a violent lot. And so unless we make sure we tear down the barriers to the ballot box so that anyone eligible can vote votes. That's where we're headed. Congressman, one last question. It's a year on. Uh, many of your Republican colleagues continue to downplay what happened, uh, saying Democrats are just uh, politicizing 1-6. Listen to your former House colleague, now Governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, today. You're going to see the D.C., New York media. I mean, this is this is their Christmas, January 6th, OK? They are going to take this and milk this for anything they could to try to be able to smear anyone who ever supported Donald Trump. How do you respond to that? Uh, Mehdi, uh, Officer Sicknick 
uh, didn't get a Christmas with his family because of what Donald Trump's mob did. It, it's an ugly comparison. Uh, Republicans uh, and, and Democrats across the country uh, are disgusted uh, by what happened uh, that day, except Republican leaders continue to stoke lies uh, about the election and, and, and seek to divide us. And unity will always be the best antidote to terrorism like that. And even if it's just a few of them, as Joe Biden said today, it may just be enough of us who stand up to act on behalf yes. of all of us. And that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. Congressman Swalwell, thank you for your time tonight. We'll have to leave it there. And thanks again to your wife. My pleasure. Thanks, Betty. Coming up, President Biden's forceful speech called out the election lies that led to January the 6th. Up next, we'll call out the lies about the January 6th insurrection. Stick around for that. My fellow Americans, in life there's truth. And tragically, there are lies. Lies conceived and spread for profit and power. We must be absolutely clear about what is true and what is a lie. Let's be absolutely clear about what is true and what is a lie in relation to 1-6. Here are four of the biggest lies that need rebutting. Lie number one, the thousands of Trump supporters who stormed and entered the Capitol that day weren't violent. In fact, this lie says they were no different from tourists just seeing the sights. If you didn't know the TV footage was a video from January the 6th, you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit. Really? Do tourists crush cops in an attempt to breach an entrance? Do they sack offices, leave threatening messages and smear their feces on the walls when they visit a national landmark? Does GOP Congressman Andrew Clyde, whom we just heard, typically help armed Capitol Police barricade the entrance to the House floor when tourists come visiting? Yeah, that's him in that photo, hiding from his tourists. Still, Donald Trump took this lie and ran with it, describing the crowd that day as full of love. One of our enterprising producers on this show combined those comments of Trump's with footage of the January 6th crowd. There was such love at that rally, and they were peaceful people. These were great people. The crowd was unbelievable. And I mentioned the word love, the love, the love in the air. I've never seen anything like it. You have people with no guns that walk down, and frankly, the doors were open, but there was also a love fest between the police, the Capitol Police, and the people that walked down to the Capitol. People who walked with no guns, with no nothing, and they're yep. tremendous in many cases cases, tremendous people, tremendous people. Feel the love from those docile tourists. In fact, here are the results of that love. More than 130 police officers injured. They suffered concussions, rib fractures, burns. One suffered a mild heart attack. Four officers who responded to the insurrection have died by suicide. Lie number two, January 6th wasn't an insurrection. You know what that was, and you also know what it wasn't. It was not an act of racism. It was not an insurrection. Come on, guys. Buffalo head guy was poised to take over the U.S. government. Are you kidding me? And it was not an insurrection. This is the truth. Even calling it an insurrection, uh, it wasn't. OK, well, whose definition of insurrection do you want? There's Merriam-Webster, an act or instance of revolting against civil authority or an established government. Yeah, sounds pretty appropriate. But you don't even have to take the literal dictionary definition for it. Take the word of the top Republican in the Senate right after the insurrection. This failed insurrection only underscores how crucial the task before us is for our republic. He's right. It was an insurrection, a failed insurrection, but an attempt to undermine the democratic workings of government with force. And Republicans understood that before they pretended not to. Lie number three, this wasn't an armed insurrection because apparently lots of people there didn't have guns. Here was Republican Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson with that lie in March. The fact of the matter is, this didn't seem as an, like an armed insurrection to me. I mean, armed, when you think here of armed, don't you think of firearms? 
Okay, let's set aside the pipe bombs that someone laid outside the Republican and Democratic Party headquarters in D.C., just blocks away from the Capitol on January 6th, which we just learned were discovered while Vice President-elect Harris was inside her party headquarters. And leave out the Alabama Trump supporter who was arrested outside the Capitol with two guns and improv 11 improvised explosives in his truck. You still have to contend with all the stun guns, chemical sprays, baseball bats, crutches, skateboards, hockey sticks, knives, zip ties, and flagpoles. Yeah, flagpoles that the crowd used as weapons. And don't forget, other rioters took batons and shields from overwhelmed cops to attack them with. Oh, and on guns, so far, half a dozen people have been arrested for firearms charges in connection with the Capitol insurrection. There were a lot of weapons present that day, including guns. And by the way, a member of the far-right Oath Keepers told prosecutors that the group had stockpiled a bunch of guns at a nearby hotel. Line number four. Well... OK, fine, they say. It was a violent crowd, but it was provoked by undercover FBI agents. That's lie number four. I know you're thinking, who believes that kind of mad garbage? Well, probably a lot of viewers of Tucker Carlson, whose Fox show was just declared to be the highest rated program on primetime cable in 2021. And here's what he said using his immense media platform last November. Person two and person three were organizers of the riot. The government knows who they are, but the government has not charged them. Why is that? You know why. They were almost certainly working for the FBI. So FBI operatives were organizing the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, according to government documents. It's nuts, and it's completely made up. For his main source, Tucker Carlson cited a website run by a former Trump White House speechwriter. Former, because in 2018, he was fired for appearing on a panel with a white nationalist. That site assumed that because FBI charging documents refer to unindicted co-conspirators who participated in the insurrection, they must be unindicted because they work for the government. And so they must have stirred up protests on behalf of the government. That's not reporting. That is a crackpot conspiracy theory based on a series of dumb assumptions. As one legal expert put it, quote, an undercover FBI informant or agent cannot be an unindicted co-conspirator, period. So it is a crackpot theory, like many of the others. These one six lies and claims are outlandish, even laughable. But we shouldn't laugh, because every dangerous lie about the dangerous coup helps pave the way for the next one. Still to come, the insurrection on January the 6th caught many of us by surprise. But to understand why Trump's enablers seized upon that date, you have to go back to a different date, December the 14th. I'll explain why on the other side of this break. What if I told you that the crucial date for understanding what happened on January the 6th, 2021, was actually three weeks earlier? Yes, December the 14th, 2020, because that was the day when the 435 members of the Electoral College would gather in every state and officially select the next president. And Trump and his campaign surrogates promised his faithful followers that with enough pressure, the Electoral College would deliver them victory. The reality is the electors do not vote in each state until December 14th. Uh, the state legislatures each have the opportunity to, to delegate you know, where they want those uh, electoral votes headed. We do have a short time frame, but again, uh, December 14th is when the Electoral College actually votes. December 14th. December 14th. But when all 50 states chose their electors on December the 14th, Joe Biden still won. The Trumpian prophecies were wrong. The rest of the country sighed a breath of relief. That was it. The election was really finally over. But whatever relief we may have felt turned out to be premature. Minutes after California's electoral votes put Biden over the top on December the 14th, Trump announced that Attorney General Bill Barr, who said he couldn't find any fraud, would be resigning. A few days later, former Trump national security advisor Michael Flynn went on national TV and said Donald Trump could use the military to overturn the election. He could order the, the um, in, within the swing states, if he wanted to, he could take military capabilities and he could place them in those states and basically rerun an election in each of those states. I mean, it's not unprecedented. I mean, these people out there talking about martial law, it's like it's something that we've never done. 
The next day, in a contentious White House meeting, Trump had to be talked out of appointing an election conspiracy theorist. Flynn lawyer Sidney released the Kraken Powell as his special counsel. At that meeting, he also had to be dissuaded from pursuing Flynn's idea to seize voting machines in key election states. But Trump does seem to have emerged from that meeting with a new plan. The following day, December the 19th, he tweeted, quote, statistically impossible to have lost a 2020 election. Big protest in D.C. on January the 6th. Be there. Will be wild. Having failed to influence the electors on December the 14th, Trump's team began to focus on the day those electoral votes were to be counted and certified by Congress, a mere formality observed in every election since the passage of the Electoral Count Act in 1877. The White House tapped John Eastman, a pro-Trump Republican lawyer, to draft a legal strategy for flipping the election. His plan, fleshed out in two bonkers memos, said that Vice President Mike Pence could use his role in overseeing the January 6th electoral count to throw out votes from key battleground states that Biden had won. Trump could then claim victory from the remaining electoral votes. On December the 20th, the, the then president met with some of his biggest Republican backers in Congress to discuss this plan, including Mo Brooks, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Jim Jordan. As all this was going on, Trump supporters began organizing on social media to descend on Washington, D.C. They were goaded on by sitting members of Congress. In early January, as Trump was calling Georgia's Secretary of State and asking him to find 11,000 votes, Republican Senator Ted Cruz was among those ramping up the rhetoric. And we are proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with you as we defend the United States of America, as we defend our Constitution, as we defend our freedom, and we will not go quietly into the night. By this point, Donald Trump and his enablers in the GOP had already tried in multiple ways to overturn an election he'd lost by more than 7 million votes. They didn't have many ideas or hopes left. But they did have a horde of angry Trump supporters descending on D.C. on January the 6th. I just want to pin you down on, on what you're trying to do. You know, are you trying to say that as of January 20th, that President Trump will be president? Well, Brad, that, that depends on what happens on Wednesday. Yes, Senator Hawley, and we all know what happened that Wednesday. Joining me now are Rick Hassan, professor of law and political science at UC Irvine and one of the country's leading election experts, and MSNBC political contributor Jelani Cobb, who is also a staff writer for The New Yorker and a professor at the Columbia Journalism School, as well as Nicole Hammer, a historian at Columbia University who focuses on conservative media. Thank you all for joining me on this special show. Uh, Rick, let me start with you. You've been loud and clear about the threat to American democracy for some time now, a year on from January the 6th. How bad how bad is it? How worried are you about this happening again or worse? Well, I think it was about a year ago I wrote a piece called I've Never Been More Worried About American Democracy. And I have to say I'm just much more worried than I was uh, because Great. of the reaction. The reaction has been either silence or acquiescence uh, as Donald Trump has continued to convince millions of people with the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen and put in place mechanisms so that what he tried and failed to do in 2020, he would have a much better chance of being able to do in 2024. Yes, indeed. They have certainly kind of uh, filled those holes in their shoddy plan from last time around. Uh, Jelani, it was an attack on democracy. We keep saying that it was. The president said so today. But in many ways, it was also an old-fashioned white riot, was it not? The amount of Confederate imagery that was present in the pro-Trump crowd, including the rebel battle flag that one insurrectionist brought into the Capitol that day. When we saw, when, I mean, when we say, after looking at these pictures, we say, well, this was an unprecedented attack. Actually, it was following a lot of American historical precedent, sadly, was it not? Oh, absolutely. You know, when, whenever someone says unprecedented, that means you just haven't examined the history most of the time. Uh, you know, when we were talking, uh, looking at this, uh, the first thing we thought about was the Wilmington riot of 1898 in North Carolina, in which a uh, sitting uh, municipal government was actually unseated uh, by mobs that also uh, were un aligned yes. to the Confederate cause. 
you know, the same thing that happened, attempted to happen uh, in New Orleans, you know, the, which culminated in the Battle of Liberty Place, uh, and, you know, full-scale uh, militia uh, fighting uh, in an attempt to unseat an, an interracial government you know, there. And so uh, there are instances where we've seen this kind of behavior before, not to mention the fact that we had seen the suppression of black votes up until 1965 in the South. So there's been this long theme of anti-democratic behavior in America, and we pretended that we didn't know anything about it on January 6th, but it was vital to understanding why January 6th happened. Yeah, and we can only hope that after January 6th, uh, some of us, many of us, have been trying to educate ourselves uh, about some of that history. We can only hope. Uh, Nicole, you've been following conservative media and its radicalization for many years now, when we talk about education and miseducation. But did you ever imagine that conservative media in this country would not only be able to create enough anger to cause an insurrection, but have the propaganda power to create an alternative reality about that insurrection in the year since? Well, certainly the development of propaganda has been part of what conservative media has been doing for decades. And we have seen, I mean, if we look back, it has been growing in power and political power pretty steadily over the past several decades, becoming more and more part of the Republican Party. So, I mean, was it possible to imagine right before the insurrection that something like this could happen? I think so, because we had all of the pieces in place. Um, and I think what's more concerning is the propaganda effort that followed, right? We have all of those texts from people at Fox News who recognized in the moment that this was something yes. horrific and then worked over the next year to write a story about how actually the people who were there, they weren't the perpetrators of the violence, but they were the victims of it. Yeah, you're referring to Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram and Brian Kilmeade, whose texts have been revealed by the 1-6 committee. Uh, shock horror, they're not honest with their audiences. Uh, Rick, yesterday Mitch McConnell said he's open to reforming the 1887 Electoral Count Act, which outlines how Congress certifies presidential votes and which made January the 6th the Trump team's focal point. Democrats say McConnell is distracting from their calls for broader voting rights reform, for the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. What is your take? Is this worth doing? solo? Surely not. Well, I think the point is that if Democrats can pass the Freedom to Vote Act and can pass uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act by making some changes to the filibuster and pleasing Senators Cinnamon Manchin, they're going to do that. Uh, I don't think that um, the Democrats are going to give up their chance to do that if they actually have a realistic chance in order to pass only uh, reforms to the Electoral College, uh, the Electoral Count Act. Uh, but if Democrats can't do that, I think this is a deal that they should take. That is, the most important thing that should be on the agenda should be trying to make it harder to subvert the outcome of future elections. And so if Democrats can't get their, their own house together, they should take an opportunity if there are willing Republican partners on the other side. It's a fair point. Uh, Jelani, you're a black man. I'm a Muslim. When you consider how black criminals and Muslim terrorists are treated, both by the legal system and by the media, and yet the January 6th pipe bomber who laid explosives in front of the RNC and DNC headquarters still walks free. We just learned today that then Vice President-elect Harris was inside the DNC when the bomb was found there. We still don't take domestic terrorism of the far-right white variety seriously in this country, do we? No, we don't. I mean, I do want to correct that, you know, I, I have very, very proudly have very many uh, good Muslim friends and uh, even family members, but I am not personally, um, but I have great respect for the faith. But I, I think that uh, the, the fact of it is that there's a differential. We've seen this since the Obama administration, uh, where they pointed out that there was this rise of white nationalist terror and that, and, and that was uh, promptly squashed. Uh, and, and jumped upon by the Republicans in Congress. Uh, and so uh, great cries of outrage in response to that. And this has been what we've seen since then, uh, nowhere near the level of alarm that we've had uh, around the, uh, what was the phrase they used, Islamic terror, that they were trying to make uh, Barack Obama say all the time. Uh, and so there's, oh, yeah. there's not any equivalence at all. 
Yeah, it's just so depressing, the double standards. It's, I don't know how many times you can draw uh, attention to it. I, as a Muslim, keep drawing attention to it because it, it kills me. Uh, Nicole, I want to go back to Steve Bannon and the alternative right-wing ecosphere in all of this, stirring up the masses with lies and conspiracies. There's that old saying, if journalism, you know, journalism is the first draft of history. And if journalism is the first draft of history, Nicole, what is this right-wing version of journalism on one six the first draft of? How much of a danger to our democracy and our shared reality does right-wing media Media play right now in American politics? So it's the first draft of the new lost cause. It's an alternative history of January 6th that was the process of rewriting it was already happening before January 6th, right? So if you listen to Steve Bannon's podcast, what you'll hear is that the real crime against democracy didn't happen on January 6th. It happened on November 3rd when the election was stolen. And that mythology has become so important to people on the right. And it has become a mythology that Republicans have embraced. A recent poll showed that 52 percent of Republicans say that what happened on January 6th was a defense of democracy rather than an attack on it. So, you know, this is going to continue to develop into this divergent history of that day. And the question is going to be how much do people who aren't Republicans begin to buy into that, particularly white Americans? Are they willing to say, you know, actually, it wasn't that bad. We need to move on. We need to heal and unite as a country. If that's the path that more Americans choose, then I think that we are in, in a pretty bad space. We're in a pretty bad space, and what's worrying is <laughs> I, I want to I look for signs of optimism and hope, but uh, I'm not seeing them right now. But I appreciate all three of you coming on the show tonight to give us such important perspective. Uh, Rick Hassan, Jelani Cobb, Nicole Hemmer, appreciate your time tonight on this special show. Up next, as the world watched the deadly assault on the U.S. Capitol, it seemed like it might be a turning point that Republicans might finally say enough and stand up to Donald Trump. In the immediate aftermath, many of them did. But what are GOP leaders saying now, one year later? Find out after the break. Congressman Mike Gallagher wasn't the only Republican to forcefully condemn the insurrection on the day itself, only to shamefully reverse himself as time passed by. Some of the highest ranking Republicans in the country have done the exact same thing in relation to 1-6, and we caught them at it. Roll the tape. Today was a dark day in the history of the United States Capitol. But thanks to the swift efforts of U.S. Capitol Police, federal, state, and local law enforcement, the violence was quelled. The Capitol is secured, and the people's work continues. I know, the, I know the media wants to distract from the Biden administration's failed agenda by focusing on one day in January. They want to use that one day wow. to try and demean uh, the, the, the character and intentions of 74 million Americans. The mob was fed lies. They were provoked by the president and other powerful people. After careful consideration, I've made the decision to oppose the House Democrats' slanted and unbalanced proposal for another commission to study the events of January the 6th. The president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mob rioters. He should have immediately denounced the mob when he saw what was unfolding. I was the first person to contact him when the riots was going on. He didn't see it. What he ended the call was saying, telling me he'll put something out to make sure to stop this. And that's what he did. He put a video out later. All I can say is uh, count me out. Enough is enough. Can we move forward uh, without President Trump? The answer is no. Yesterday, in particular, the president's language and rhetoric crossed a line and it was reckless. Uh, I disagree with it. And they look at Donald J. Trump and they look at the millions and millions of people inspired who went to battle fighting alongside President Trump, and they're terrified. And they want him to go away. Let me tell you this right now, Donald J. Trump ain't going anywhere. As the dust from the insurrection settled, we weren't just left with the question, how did this happen? We were also left wondering, what kind of people would do such an extreme thing? Believe it or not, according to the data and the research, this was an attack, not just by a bunch of far-right extremist groups, think 
Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, etc., but also by much more ordinary people, lawyers and dentists, teachers and accountants, who laid siege to the Capitol building. So far, more than 700 people have been charged federally, well over 300 with at least one felony, 174 have pleaded guilty, and 74 have been sentenced, almost half to jail or prison. There has been some legal accountability. But if history has shown us something repeatedly, it's that you can jail a person, but you can't jail an idea. And that's just as true when it comes to January the 6th. In fact, the ideas that motivated the attack on our capital are not only alive and well, I'm sorry to say, they're growing. A team of researchers led by Robert Pape at the University of Chicago is out with a new study that estimates 21 million people today, not last year, believe that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president and that the use of force to restore Donald Trump to the presidency is justified. He writes that the number one belief among the insurrectionists shared by fully 75% of respondents is the great replacement theory. That's the white supremacist belief we've discussed on this show before, one that says majority white populations are deliberately being replaced by minorities as part of a liberal plot to change the country. Last June, at the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, President Biden highlighted the threat of white supremacy in America. According to the intelligence community, terrorism from white supremacy is the most lethal threat to the homeland today. Not ISIS, not Al-Qaeda, white supremacists. That's not me. That's the intelligence community under both Trump and under my administration. But what do we do when supremacist ideology isn't just thriving on the extremes? when it's being pumped out by conservative media day after day, when it's being amplified by one of our two main political parties and the former president from self-imposed Mar-a-Lago exile. How many more violent insurrections are we going to have? Who better to ask than Cynthia Miller Idris? She's a professor and runs the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab at American University and is author of the 2020 book, Hate in the Homeland. Uh, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Uh, Cynthia, you're out with a new piece in the New York Times this week, uh, which, which has headlined, America's most urgent threat now comes from within. And you make the same point, writing, what makes the threat especially pernicious is that it is not from the fringe, but from the mainstream. So what do you think when you hear people saying, well, it's not a big deal, uh, you know, these are fringe white supremacists, it's wrong to tar all Trump supporters in this way. Just how mainstream is it? Because you have Robert Pape out with research saying 21 million people are willing to take violent action to put Trump back in the White House. Right. Well, first of all, it's great to see you. Happy New Year. and glad to be back. Um, you know, I, I think we're really facing a tremendous threat at the moment of, for, for democracy itself. I mean, the stability of our democracy itself. And so when, when you see things like, you know, a majority of Republicans uh, saying that they either support what happened on the insurrection or they don't believe that the election itself was legitimate, or as we've also seen in recent polling, large numbers saying that they will not support the results of the 2024 election uh, if their candidate loses. What we're seeing is a total failure of democracy itself. And that landed us on a list of backsliding democracies uh, uh, in December. And when that happened, you have about nine years, according to the data, until the system either collapses or is restored. So we do need to make some long-term changes in how we intervene now and not just focus on, of course, we need to focus on accountability, but we can't only focus on that, on, on what happened on January 6th. We have to start looking at ways to turn the tide. That the insurrectionists aren't coming from the fringe, of course, is only half the story. Researchers have also pointed out they're being motivated by a fringe white supremacist belief that's now pretty much made it into the right wing mainstream. The great replacement theory. That's a theory that's been peddled by the far right and by members of the Republican Party. And it's a favorite of Tucker Carlson, the most watched host on cable news. How much does that frighten you when you hear Tucker Carlson talking about it in a totally normal way? Do you think ordinary Americans understand the gravity of all this? 
I don't think ordinary Americans do understand it, but I think they're very affected by it. And I think it's it's the way that persuasive rhetoric works from the extreme as it makes its way into the fringes. It becomes normalized. It becomes mainstream and people become less shocked by it. And as that shock value starts to decline, um, people start thinking it's not so bad. They start getting used to it and they start incorporating that way of thinking. It's how you move the Overton window around acceptable policy solutions. And so people start thinking border closure maybe do make sense or they support a Muslim ban or they support or they just look the other way. And so we have this incredible danger, I think, as you start to normalize things that previously people would have seen for the extreme kind of ideas that they are. Uh, yes, indeed. And let me ask you this. Um, you are someone who knows this movement better than most. Is there a way to stop it? You talked earlier about the timeline. What would you be saying to Joe Biden, to Democratic leaders about what needs to be done to law enforcement agencies across the board. How do we deal with this movement? Is there a way to reduce the number of followers? Or are we inevitably on course to another insurrection, another coup, a civil war, as Barbara Walter said on this show last night? Well, I think in this country, we have only ever been able to think about political violence as a security and intelligence problem. And the only way I see ourselves getting out of this is to shift that way of thinking to include education, a multi-sectoral. So we need digital literacy. We need media literacy. We need to help teach people how to recognize disinformation and propaganda. I mean, some of the basic civic education things that have been abandoned in this country, but which form the basis of kind of Germany's defense of democracy approach. You can't fight the fringes if it's already in the mainstream by only focusing on the fringe. And I I think that's our mistake right now is only looking at these extreme groups and not understanding this is a battle we have to fight in our schools and our communities and our churches in everyday life. Uh, and it has to be done by investments that include expertise that's outside of the normal range of what we think of as an expert to treat extremist violence. Cynthia Miller Idris, thank you so much for your time. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, appreciate your analysis as ever. Still to come, as we close out tonight's show on the attempted murder of American democracy, the question is, will we move forward and what scenarios could play out in the very near future if we don't act now? My final thoughts after this short break.
are coming to the end now of our special show tonight to mark the first anniversary of the January 6th insurrection. A year ago, the seat of our democracy was violently attacked. At around 8 p.m. Eastern, exactly a year ago, the Capitol was declared secure and the Senate was reopened by a defiant Mike Pence and Mitch McConnell. And yet still, eight Republican senators would go on that night to vote against the certification of the vote, joined by 139 of their GOP colleagues in the House, even as the blood was still wet in the hallways of the Capitol. That's what they did. In the days and months since that attack on Congress, we have seen Republicans, both politicians and voters, get even more radicalized. We've seen the big lie get even more entrenched. We've seen voting rights hammered at the state level. We are, as I have said many times before on this show, in the midst of a rolling insurrection. And look, I'm not an American by birth. I'm an American by choice. I swore my oath of allegiance to this country and became a proud citizen less than three months before those traitors and fascists wearing Nazi t-shirts and carrying Confederate flags tried to murder American democracy. I chose to be here because I value freedom. Not the freedom not to wear a mask, but the freedom to choose your own government. And so now I choose to be in this fight, which is a fight, as the president put it today, for the soul of America. A fight that requires a media, a fourth estate, that won't both sides this struggle, and that will call out the forces of authoritarianism and extremism that threaten our republic. That's what we have done on this show since 1-6, and that is what we will do with your support every night going forward. That does it for the Mehdi Hassan Show this week. Thank you for watching. Eamon Moyuddin is in the chair tomorrow night here on Peacock. And I'll see you Sunday night, 8 p.m. live on MSNBC, where I'll kick off another week of in-depth interviews with key newsmakers. You can join us anytime on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. For now, from me, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.